Hey guys, I am in Singapore and about to see one of the greatest architectural and botanical wonders of this world. Gardens by the Bay is a 250-acre nature park. Now we're going to concentrate on one of the climate-controlled conservatories today. A feat like this hasn't been accomplished before, so I'm curious how they're maintaining tens of thousands of plants in this dome. I'll be meeting with horticulturist Chad Davis and we're going to explore what's in the cloud forest dome. Hey there! Good morning, Summer. Nice to meet you. Nice to see you as well. I'm really excited for this. Welcome to the cloud forest. <laughs> Thank you. When did you actually start here at the Gardens by the Bay? In uh, June of 2011. Okay, so seven years. Yep, a little bit over seven years. And when I came, they were still putting the glass on the cloud forest here. The, the building wasn't finished yet. So how did you get tipped off to this? I worked at the Desert Botanical Garden in Phoenix, Arizona. And one of the candidates we were interviewing for, um, for a position there had also applied for a position here in Singapore. And I was touring him around the greenhouses and he told me about it and it sounded really cool. So I went and uh, um, typed it up when I got back to the office and thought, wow, this and is gonna so, be cool. So is he or she angry that you swiped that position? Nope, I don't think so. Um, he ended up with a pretty good position in Costa Rica. Okay, and I think, nice. uh, I think things worked out well for him and yeah. things worked out well for me as well. And had you been to Singapore before you got this job? Um, I haven't. Okay, nope, so. I'd been around Southeast Asia yeah. a bit and I knew about Singapore, but I uh, had never been here. So this was really a new and exciting experience for you? Yes, oh yep, absolutely. God. How much did you know about Gardens by the Bay before you got here, if it was being built? So the uh, landscape architect had done some 3D renderings and had a virtual fly-through of what the garden was going to be, and it looked like, um, like Avatar. <laughs> pretty impressed with what they had come up with, and I think we did a pretty good job of making those videos become reality. I mean, I've been to a lot of conservatories before, but you, they really take kind of homage to the 1800s and, you know, or 1600s in some cases if you're in Europe. But this is very futuristic. It, it seems like it, you know, there's certain aspects of this that I feel like have not been done before. Yeah, I think most of this hasn't been done before. Um, we've got 3,800 square meters of vertical planting on the mountain. We're one degree off of the equator, so it's 12 hours of sunlight, 12 hours of night all year long and we are trying to keep plants cool. Almost every other greenhouse or conservatory in the world is trying to keep things warm during the winter time. Cooling a greenhouse, I mean, is that a huge energy hog? I mean, how do you go about doing that? Um, it can be, but we try to be as sustainable as we can be. Um, there's a special selective filter on the glass that lets in the photosynthetically active light, but keeps out the far end of the spectrum that carries most of the heat. There are chilled water pipes running through the floor that keep the concrete from absorbing heat. And then we make our own electricity on site. We burn about 80 tons of green waste from all over the island, trees, and even from the shipping industry. So is that like a, with a biofuel, or how does that actually work? Uh, it's called a biofurnace okay. and a cogen power oh, plant. Cogen. Yeah, okay. We burn the waste, and we use it a few different ways. Um, it makes enough electricity to cool the conservatories. Um, and then there's heat left over, and there's a heat exchange system. I don't know exactly how all the engineering works, but it is what drives the uh, chillers in the floor. And then they came up with another system that's called a liquid desiccant system that dries the air before it goes into the chillers. Um, and here in Singapore, where it's 95% humidity, 95% of the time, um, it increases the efficiency of the chillers by about 10% and that system will pay for itself over a matter of time. I'm assuming right after this was built, it became a model for other places. Yeah, we are a model for the world now. A lot of people are coming to us regularly and asking our advice on how other projects can proceed. We've had Koreans and Omanis and even local here in Singapore, the airport is building a, a conservatory that will open up next year. And we're advising on that one as well. From uh, green walls to urban planning to uh, sustainable energy use. 
I'm sure there's like so much stuff that you have like uncovered in the seven or eight years that you've been here. But I'm also curious about like what you've learned because here you said, you know, you were working in Arizona, you're a desert plant guy. And there are desert plants here, not in the cloud forest, but at Gardens by the Bay. So what have you kind of taken away and learned from this experience thus far? Oh, um, I couldn't begin to tell you how much I've learned. I think the biggest thing is, is looking at things as a system, looking at how everything is interconnected and how the irrigation system and the fog system and the shade system and the glass and everything all comes together and it's all necessary to keep everything going. And what's maintenance like for this? So we close down one day a month for maintenance and we'll bring in a crane lorry or three or four different boom lifts. Sometimes we have rope access guys hanging from the mountains. Repelling down, literally, wow. Uh -huh. Out of curiosity, you know, I see so many different ways that you could affix plants vertically, but how did you pick and choose what would be the best for this situation? Did Gardens by the Bay do a lot of testing before they actually started doing the vertical structure? Yep, so there were mock-ups done for all the different systems that we're using. In here, we have three different models on how we're doing the green walls. In the outdoor, we've got a few other systems that we're using. And then we have a new project that's called uh, Floral Fantasies that is using a few newer versions. The last time I was in Singapore, it was 2005, and it was nowhere nearly this green. So how do you think Gardens by the Bay fits into Singapore's overall greening initiatives? Well, I think Gardens by the Bay shows the interest of the government and the effort that they're willing to put into greening the city. They've funded us to get us to opening, and when they talk about greening Singapore, they're serious. Well, I cannot wait to actually go in the forest and go in depth with you with some of these species because I know a lot of folks will actually want to be seeing not just a cursory tour, but like what's actually growing on the inside. So shall we do it? Yep. Great. All right. Stay tuned to the next four episodes as Chad and I tour the two acre cloud forest dome at Gardens by the Bay. If you enjoyed this video, then give it a thumbs up. And if you're keen to support the channel, then click on the subscribe button and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss a beat. And remember, you could follow along on my blog at homesteadbrooklyn.com, my daily journey on Instagram at homesteadbrooklyn, and dive into the recently released Houseplant Masterclass, the first comprehensive online course on houseplant cultivation, care, and maintenance at houseplantmasterclass.com.